Okay, on these first two problems, we are supposed to identify the vertex, complete a table of values with at least two points, and sketch the graph. So that means that I'm going to start off looking at my equation, and it depends on which equation, what kind of equation I have as to how I start. Like, this on number one is in standard form, and so there's a formula that we use when we're in standard form that helps us find the vertex, and that formula is negative v over 2a. So whenever it's in standard form, meaning it's x squared and then x and then a number, then this is a and this is b and this is c. It goes in order. So we need a negative b, but b is negative also, and then over 2 times a, which is 1 since there's not a number in front of x squared. So if I work that out, that's positive 6 over 2, which is 3. So this helps me with my problem because if I make a table of values, or if I just list the points, my vertex is 3 comma something. And so we just need to figure out what the something is that goes with that. And the way I do that is I come back up to my problem and I say, well, what is 3 squared minus 6 times 3 plus 5? If I work that out, I should get a negative 4. And so that's what goes in for my y value. Now, this next step can be kind of tricky, but you're supposed to do the same thing anytime. Um, we want to pick other points to use because just knowing that the vertex is 3, negative 4 isn't enough for us to work out what the whole parabola looks like, probably. So we need to pick more x values to plug in. And the way to do that is to pick a number close to 3. Well, there's two numbers really close to 3, 2, and 4. And it doesn't matter which one you pick. Uh, just pick one number that's close to 3, so like 2, and then pick the number that's next to that so that it should be like counting up or down um, depending on which one you pick. And so then we're going to do the same thing we did before, and we're going to plug in the 2 and that gives us negative 3 and then we can plug in 1 and again like it'll be 1 squared minus 6 times 1 plus 5 and that'll give us zero. So now that we have these points, we can graph it. 3, negative 4 is right here. And so that's what we're going to be reflecting across. So 2, negative 3, and then 1, 0. What I'm going to do is there's like a imaginary line here that's my axis of symmetry that I reflect those points. So like here's my vertex. It doesn't get reflected, but I'm going to reflect 2, negative 3 over, and then I'm going to put 1, 0 over on this other side. And then I'll just draw my parabola. Number 2 is a little different because they give it to us in vertex form, which is actually supposed to make it easier. Vertex form, like written out with letters, is y equals a times x minus h squared plus k. And so the parts of this that they're telling us is the vertex. Whatever's inside your parentheses, you change the sign. So if it's a negative inside, you make it positive. Whatever's on the outside, you don't change the sign. And so hk is our vertex. Now, whenever I look at my problem then up here on number 2, I take the negative 1 from the inside and I say that that makes the x value of my vertex be 1. And then I take the outside, which is the plus 2, and that gives me my y value. And so that helps me start my table of values, 1, 2. So then I'm going to pick numbers that are close to 1. It doesn't matter what numbers you pick. You can pick 2 and 3. You can pick 0 and negative 1. You pick them, and to find the y values, you have to plug them back in where x is. So either in your head or in your calculator, you're doing like negative and then 2 minus 1 squared and plus 2. Work that out, and you get 1. And you do the same thing for 3. You would just replace that 2 with a 3, and you get negative 2. And we're going to plug all this in not plug all this in, we're going to graph this, so 1 comma 2 and then 2 comma 1 and then 3 comma negative 2. This does open down and I know that because there's a negative in front of my uh, parentheses here 
So if that helps you realize like how to reflect or whatever, here is our problem. Here we've got a couple of word problems and they're asking us about maximums and minimums, which if we remember that for parabolas, maximums and minimums are our vertex, then that's helpful. There's two ways to do each of these. Um, one way is to plug into our calculator and find the maximum or the minimum. Um, and the only problem with that is sometimes you have to adjust the window for that, which can be uh, difficult or frustrating. The other way of doing it is to find the vertex the same way we found it for the last couple problems where we were graphing. So that does require on number three, since this is in standard form, well kind of in standard form, we're going to have to use negative b over 2a. The problem though, and the thing that could trip you up, is it's not in the correct order. So instead of this being a, b, and c in order, this is really c, b, and a. So if I plug that in, that's negative negative 20 times 2 um, over 2 times 0.25 which uh, gives me 40. Now that's the x part of my problem and so we have to pay attention to what it's asking us. It says how many units should be produced to yield a, ma a minimum cost. Then we look at x and x is telling us the number of items or units that we with C being the cost. So we don't want the Y value, we want the X value. The answer is 40 units or 40 items. If they had asked us for the minimum cost, then we would have to plug the 40 back in up here for our X's to figure out what the minimum cost would actually be. And that's like, that could actually be something that you were asked. That's like a total possibility. So you have to pay attention to what they're asking and what the x and the other letter in your equation are actually telling you. Number four here, it's in vertex form, and we want to find the price that will maximize the company's profit. So the price is our x. So once we know the x value of our vertex, we're good. So this is in vertex form, which means this is the x value. We change the sign and get 16. Price is in dollars, and so the answer to this is $16. On both of these, you could plug in the equations to y equal and then find your max or min, and that would be a perfectly legit way of doing it. Um, just whichever way you want to do it is fine. Okay, use the information provided to write the vertex form equation of each parabola. So they're giving us the vertex and they're giving us a point, and so what we need to know is the vertex form equation in general, which is this, and so our vertex is h and k. The other point we have is just a generic x and y. So our vertex is a point, which means it's an x value and a y value also, but it's a very special point that will, ch will um, be unique in our formula, and so instead of calling it x and y again, we call it h and k. So we want to plug in what we know, like we know that y is going to be 11 halves. We don't know a right now, that's what we're going to end up solving for. x is 4, h is 7, k is 10. Once we've got this all plugged in, we're going to do a couple things, like we can subtract the 10 over to the left side. If it helps you change to change 11 halves to a decimal, or to just do it in your calculator and leave it as a decimal, then that's fine. That would be um, 5.5 .5 minus 10, which is negative 4.5. Now, 4 minus 7 gives us negative 3. Negative 3 squared is 9, so this is like 9a. And so you got to be careful because if we'd done this in a different order and you had a times 9 plus 10, you might do 9 plus 10, which is the wrong order of operations. So you don't want to do that. I want to finish this by dividing by 9. And that may look scary, but that's just negative 1 half. So now I take what a is and what I already knew my vertex was, and I plug it into my formula and x and y will actually be x and y this time. So this is negative 1 halves, and then 
um, x minus 7 squared plus 10. On the next one, it's asking us basically the same thing. It says find the vertex, then write the equation of the parabola in vertex form. And so we still are using this formula that we had, and this time we actually know what a is. Whenever I write this out, like for the quadratic formula or finding the vertex, a is 2. Like that's the same as this a right here. So I know already that a is 2. What I don't know is my vertex, and that's what I need to find. So this is where we do negative b over 2a. So that's going to be negative 16 over 2 times 2, which is negative 4. That's the h part of our vertex, because it's the x value part. Then we have to go back and plug in the negative 4. And figure out what this gives us for our y value. which it should give us negative 5. And so that's k. So when I write this out, this will be y equals 2x plus 4 squared minus 5. It's a plus 4, remember, because in our formula there's a negative h, and our h was already negative, so it makes it switch signs. Factor on 7, 8, 9, and 10. Now, this is like an example basically of three different kinds of factoring almost. Like number 7 is the um, fairly straightforward factoring where you just have to come up with what multiplies to get 56 that adds to get 15. So I think about all the things that multiply to get 56 and I go, aha, 7 and 8. If you're really bad at multiplication tables or just you come across one that you're having problems with, if you're really systematic and go through, like, on your calculator, like, dividing by 2 and seeing what that gives you and then trying dividing by 3, which this one doesn't divide by 3. If you keep going, like, eventually you would have gotten to divide by 7 and hopefully realize that that's what you wanted to use. But it can be hard to think of the numbers sometimes. You just have to do your best. On 8, they all have an x that we can take out. Uh, unfortunately, they don't also have a 3. That would be nice because since they don't all have a 3, we are going to have to slide and divide. The other way of doing that is to guess and check, um, or you might know of another way to factor this, but this x is going to hang out. We're going to factor this by slide and divide. So I'm going to slide the 3 over to the 56, which means I need to multiply. 3 times 56 is 168. So then we have to come up with what multiplies get 168, that adds get negative 29. That can be pretty tricky. You're going to have to probably try a lot of options. And again, I like to be systematic about it and like divide by 2, divide by 3 until I get to something that works. And so this might take you a while because we need negative 21 and negative 8. So this is x minus 21, x minus 8. So that is where we slid the 3. Now we have to divide by 3. And so if it does divide like 21 over 3, we go ahead and do that. That's x minus 7. If it doesn't like 8 over 3, you move the 3 in front of the x. So that's 3x minus 8. And then don't forget about your x from the beginning. That needs to go in front. So that's 8 completely factored out. The next one, number 9, we are going to factor. Anytime you only have two terms, basically the only thing we can do is either see if they have something in common or see if it's the sum and difference of two squares. So this is the sum and difference of two squares because I can take the square root of both of these uh, if I take the square root of a squared, I get a. If I take the square root of 16b squared, I get 4b. What you have to remember is that that's going to be one parenthesis with a plus and another with a minus. So the key is there's two terms. There's a minus sign, and you can take the square root of both of those, and that's how that splits up. This last one, with four terms, you have to factor by grouping. So you group the first two together and the last two together, 
and you treat it like two separate factoring problems. So the first two have a 2a squared in common. So we take the 2a squared out and have 3z, because when we take it out, it's like we're dividing by 2a squared, plus 4c. Then I look at 9xz plus 12xc and see what they have in common. They both have a 3x that we can take out. So that gives us 3z plus 4c. Now, what's supposed to happen, and what did happen, is that these both are the same parentheses, and so that's one of the things we write down, is the parentheses they have in common. It's actually like we're factoring out the common parentheses, and then we write what's left over in another parentheses, the 2a squared and the 3x. Uh, notice on all of these that there was no equal zero because all we were doing is factoring. In order for you to set it equal to zero and keep going, it has to say the word solve or something else that indicates that you're supposed to keep going with the problem. Describe the end behavior of each polynomial function. So what it wants us to do is recognize the properties of graphs so that we can say as our graph goes to the left, is it going to rise or fall? And as our graph goes to the right, is it going to rise or fall? And so we do that by looking at the biggest exponent and the number that's in front. And so this is something you can memorize. There's like a chart that we made. This is also something you can graph. Now, the person who wrote this problem, 11 and 12, we're trying to be tricky and make it hard for you to graph. But... Um, all we need to do is basically ignore the a, b, c, and d, or the a and b, and either pick numbers to put in, or just not put anything there at all so that it makes it 1. What I mean is if you type in to y equals negative x to the 4th minus x cubed plus x squared plus x, like it should... Um, it should graph, and it should give you a graph that's good enough to tell your end behavior. What happens, because it's a negative x to the fourth, is it should look kind of like a parabola that opens down. There may be some wiggling in the middle that happens, but as I go to the left, it's falling, and as I go to the right, it's falling. So I write that as falls left, falls right. So I knew the same thing on 12 where I just look at the biggest exponent and the fact that it's positive. A positive odd power means that this is going to look kind of like a line with maybe a little turn in the middle or something like that. And so this falls left and rises right. And so what the rules are for these, if you want to memorize them instead of trying to graph them, is that if it's an even power, they either both go up or both go down. They both go up if it's positive, they both go down if it's negative. If it's an odd power, they're opposite. And so it's going to look like either this if it's positive or this if it's negative. So that's kind of the info you need there for that. So this says find the zeros of the polynomial function algebraically and to determine the multiplicity of each zero. The multiplicity really only matters when you get an answer more than once because then we need to specify that we got it more than once. And that's all that multiplicity means is how many times we've gotten something. Finding the zeros uh, is what indicates to us that this is a different kind of problem than just factoring. So we do want to factor, but we also want to say, hey, this is going to equals zero and we're going to actually get some answers at the end. So the first thing I want to do on 13 is take the x out that they all have in common. And then I want to look at the inside and say, okay, I should probably be able to factor this some more. We can either slide and divide to do that, or this actually, um, no, never mind, slide and divide. Um, 
you might be able to do guess and check on this one, um, or you might not. So I'm going to slide the 3 over to the 25 and get x squared plus 20x plus 75. I need to think of what multiplies to get 75 that adds to get 20, which is 15 and 5. And then I, because I slid the 3 earlier, I'm going to divide by the 3 right now. So if it doesn't divide like this first one, then I move the 3 in front of the x. If it does divide like on the second one, then I divide it. So this is 3x plus 5 and uh, x plus 5. But don't forget to put your x that was there at the beginning. We're going to set all of these equal to 0 and solve, so we get x equals 0. On um, the next one, I should get negative 5 thirds, and then I should get negative 5. All of those have a multiplicity of 1. On 14, we've got an x in common for all of them. So we're going to write this as x, and then x squared plus 10x plus 12. Then we're looking to see if there's something that multiplies c at 12 that adds c at 10. And if you go through, there's not a ton of choices for 12. None of them add to get 10. And so that means that we're going to have to use the quadratic formula on this part right here. We're not going to worry. The x on the outside is going to give us an answer of x equals 0. But then I should have two more answers from the quadratic formula. So this is going to be um, a is 1, b is 10, and c is 12. We're going to do x equals negative b plus and minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over to a. So we need to start by doing what's under the square root. Let's see, 10 squared is 100 minus 48 will give us 52. So this is going to be negative 10 plus and minus the square root of 52 over 2. If I can simplify the square root of 52 and bring out a number that's divisible by 2, I can keep going and simplify this. So for 52, we need to think about what multiplies together, which would be 4 and 13. And then so 4 splits into 2 and 2. There's a pair of 2s and a 13 left over. So this is negative 10 plus or minus 2 square roots of 13 over 2. So because negative 10, 2, and 2 are all divisible by 2, I can do that and simplify. If any of those had not been divisible by 2 or some number that they had in common, then I wouldn't be able to. So negative 5 plus and minus the square root of 13 are my other two answers for this. Because I got 0 earlier, you want to make sure to put that somewhere, and then I got negative 5 plus and minus the square root of 13. 15. There's nothing in common. There is a x to the fourth, which means whenever I factor this into two parentheses, I'm going to put x squared and x squared. I'm also going to slide and divide here. So I'm going to look at this as x to the fourth plus 17x squared minus 18. And I'm going to split this up into x squared and x squared and say what well, multiplies to get nay of 18 that adds to get 17, which is plus 18 and minus 1. But I'm not done because I have to divide by the 2 that we slid earlier. So I get x squared plus 9 and 2x squared um, minus 1. I'm going to set both of those equal to 0 and solve. So when I solve the first one, x squared plus 9, I have to subtract 9, and then square root. And when I square root negative 9, that gives me plus and minus 3i. So 
really important that you remember when you square root to solve an equation, you have to put a plus or minus sign. When I do the next one, I have to start off by adding 1 and dividing by 2. So I get 1 half. I square root both sides. So I get x equals plus and minus um, square root of 1 half. Well, I can take the square root of 1 on top. I can't take the square root of 2 on bottom. This is something that we rationalized a bunch last semester because of those pesky 45 degree angles. So this is really plus and minus the square root of 2 over 2, which is not really related to what we did in trig. It just so happens that that's an answer we got. And so on 14 and 15, all of those answers also, we got a multiplicity of 2. So if any of the, I mean 1, got a multiplicity of 1. Our answer has happened one time. Even though these are plus and minuses, we still got like a positive answer and then a negative answer, which are different. You get a multiplicity of 2 whenever you factor and then like the two parentheses are the same. And so they both, if you solve both of them, you get the same answer twice. On 16, the best thing to do is to graph it. It says approximate, which means that it's okay to get on your calculator and um, get uh, decimals. And so it wants the zeros, the maximums, and the minimums. It says minima and maxima because in math, that's what we call the plural of maximum and minimum instead of maximums and minimums. Um, but anyway, so I graphed this. Uh, ahead of time so I could show you what it looks like. Don't forget if you've been messing with your window that Zoom 6 will give you back a standard window and so what we need to do is use the second trace menu and go through one at a time to find these like you're going to do second trace and pick uh, the second option which is zero and then I don't remember which comes first the maximum or minimum but three is either max or min, and then four is the other one. So you basically have to do three different problems. On each of them, it asks you for a left bound and a right bound, and then to guess. So like on the zero, up here would be a left bound, down here would be a right bound. You move it to the middle to guess. You could either write the answer as 1.896, like x equals, or you could write the whole point if you wanted to, as 1.896 comma zero, um, but since it will, like, that y value has to be 0 for it to be a 0. The y part of that isn't as important. But these other two, um, write down the whole point for me. This is a minimum because it's down on the bottom of a valley. This is a maximum because it's at the top of a valley. So the minimum is 3, negative 5, and the maximum is 5, negative 1. Find a polynomial in standard form that has the given zeros. So this is the opposite of what we did like two problems ago. We want to put these in as like factors where we change the sign. So x plus 1, x either plus or minus 0, x plus 2. But then it's really best if you either don't write it as x minus 0 and just write it x at the beginning in the first place. Or if you realize, hey, x minus 0, I don't really need the minus 0 part of that, whichever that'll make it easier to multiply if you don't carry the zero through. I'm going to foil these two together and then distribute the x. So this is x squared plus 1x plus 2x plus 2. So I add the middle terms together and get x squared plus 3x plus 2. Then I multiply the x through all of those and get x cubed plus 3x squared plus 2x Wow. I was trying to write x and I wrote y and then try to fix that and it just didn't work out. 2x. And then normally we see like a y equals or an f of x equals in front of that. But that's our answer. The next one, 4 multiplicity 3 means we're going to put x minus 4, but we need to put it 3 times. If it was a multiplicity of 2, we'd put it 2 times. If it was a multiplicity of 4, we'd be sad, but we'd put it 4 times. So to multiply this out, we're going to have to do two steps. So the first step is to take the first two and foil together. So we get x squared. If I do outer and inner, they both are negative 4x and add together to get negative 8x. Negative 4 times negative 4 is plus 16. Then I'm going to distribute x minus 4. 
So there's a mistake that a bunch of people make that you need to watch out for. I need to distribute the x through, which is x cubed plus 8x squared plus 16x, and then distribute the negative 4 through the same thing, and then add like terms. And so you can write it over here next to your problem, or you can write it underneath so you can see pretty easily where your like terms are, and it doesn't really matter which one of those that you decide to do. I like to put it underneath, so this is negative 4x squared plus 32x minus 64. Add them all together, so this is y equals 4x, wait, I skipped um, x cubed, which is silly, x cubed plus 4x squared plus 48x minus 64. Um, now we're going to solve some equations, and they specify the method to use. So 19 says to solve by completing the square. That's where we wanted to have p squared plus 16p and a blank, which means I need to subtract the 42 over to the other side, which gives me negative 39. And then we put another blank. To figure out what goes in the blank, remember good old Professor Hoffman squared, who says to huff the number in front of p, and then square it. So you half 16, or half it, which is 8, and then you square it and get 64. So plus 64 and plus 64. Then we factor p squared plus 16p plus 64. It factors into p plus 8 twice, so that's p plus 8 squared. That was why we picked 64, so that we could factor it like that. Negative 39 plus 64 is 25. We're going to square root both sides and get p plus 8 equals positive and negative 5. And then subtract 8 from both sides. So p equals negative 8 plus 5 and negative 8 minus 5. So it equals uh, negative 3 and negative 13. 20, we're solving by taking square root, so you want to subtract the 2, and then divide by 2, and then once r squared is by itself, we are going to square root both sides. So square rooting means it's plus and minus. I can check 15 and see if it splits into anything that can come out of the square root. It doesn't but the negative underneath can be an i on the outside, so I write plus and minus i square root to 15. Ooh, 21, solve by using the quadratic formula. First thing is we need this in standard form. We need x squared, then x, and then 10. So I'm gonna subtract the 9x over and get 5x squared minus 9x plus 10 equals zero. And then I'm going to say, well, that makes a 5, b negative 9, and c 10. It's really important that you make sure it's in the right order, all on the same side, before you start. So x equals negative b plus and minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So we're going to put the inside of this in um, our calculator. Make sure if you are doing it in your calculator that you put the negative 9 in parentheses with the squared outside the parentheses just like what I have. That's positive 81 and then we end up minusing 200 and so underneath our square root we get negative 119 which sounds like a terrible number. Then those negatives can cancel in front of the 9 and get positive. The bottom is 10. All we can do to this is uh, move the negative out and make it an i, because 119, wait, does it, the 7 go into 119? Because I feel like it might. Let me check. It does, but it goes 7 and 17. 
So this doesn't simplify anymore. So this is 9 plus and minus i square roots of 119 over 10. This last section is adding and multiplying and sub subtracting and dividing things with i's. And so on 22, the first two parentheses, parentheses we're trying to add together, but then we're going to subtract the last one. So if I add the first two together, I get 3 minus 12i. But then when I subtract, what I'm doing is actually making it a negative 5 and a plus 5i. I'm changing the signs and then adding like terms. Like if I distribute the negative, the negative's not outside the parentheses anymore, so I can add. That gives us negative 2 minus 7i for our answer. 23, we need to FOIL. So we're going to do negative 7 times 7, which is negative 49. Negative 7 times negative 5i is positive 35i. 7i times 7 is 49i. And 7i times negative 5i is negative 35i squared. So we want to change the i squared to a negative 1. And if I do that, that makes this be a plus 35 instead of a minus 35 which means I can add negative 49 and positive 35 together and get negative 14. 35i plus 49i is 84i. When you have an i on the bottom, the goal is to get it off the bottom onto the top. And so on 24, we take negative 4 plus 3i and we multiply by its conjugate, negative 4 minus 3i. We have to do it to the top and the bottom. The reason is because if I FOIL this out on bottom, the outer and inner terms cancel out. So on bottom, we'll have 16 minus 9i squared. On top, we'll have to distribute, get negative 12i minus 9i squared. Now those 9i squareds do not cancel out. That's like never a thing. That happens if I'm subtracting on top and subtracting on bottom. You can only cancel if everything has the same number in common, and that's not happening here. Instead, we want to change the i squareds to negative ones and see what happens. Like on top, that'll be positive 9 minus 12i. On bottom, that'll be 16 plus 9, which is 25. Or the answer could be written as 9 over 25 minus 12 over 25i. On 25, since all there is is an i with a negative 10 on bottom and there's not like a pesky other number in front of that, we just need to times the top and the bottom by i or negative i or 10i or negative 10i. Like, as long as you multiply with some kind of i, uh, you'll get the right answer. We also, if we want to, can go ahead and cancel the negative 10s and make this be 1 over i because they're going to cancel at some point anyway. So, if I go ahead and cancel them and then times by i on the top and the bottom, I get i over i squared. I change the i squared to a negative 1, which means I have i over negative 1, which is a negative i.